that sort of raises the other question that I kind of thought about where it's like you in, and I read the piece actually on the Tar Heel for from 2011 to just kind of take a look at it because I kind of was, oh please don't um, I'm not quoting it so, yeah but it's out there if people want to look it up yeah you know, the link in the description <laughs> um, but it, it's sort of like how does it feel because in many ways you kind of start the conversation with silence now it, it, it's your piece that really kind of jump starts and says Carr said these things about confederate yeah monument is dedicated so it's like it's it how does it feel being that start being the start of that historic narrative to bring down silent sam well there's sort of there's sort of two aspects to that and i i think i think the first aspect is on the one hand i um i think we should be careful about saying that that i caused it to come down i don't know what would have happened without that speech um i do think that also the activists really are the ones who who utilized the research and saw a way to use it to bring about their goals. And I think that is, that is in some ways really the story is the way that activists took, because I don't think I saw this as a tool of activism at the time. And I think, I, to be totally honest, um, if you read the old letter, um, yeah. I'm, I'm very naive in my expectations yeah. about what we can do with this. I'm like, whatever we do, we should be honest about what they, you know, I mean, it was very sort of- had like four or five, options I, I remember yeah, i mean and i and i, and I, I saw it's very short most of it got cut actually the original letter was much longer uh, most of it is the quote the famous quote where julian carr of course brags about whipping a woman um and and i think what really what this speech did and where that letter does play a role is that it shifted the debate in a way that historians aren't surprised by you know karen cox had oh, yeah. sh already shown years before the ties between confederate monuments and white supremacy this wasn't a surprise to anyone who's a historian right but what this did show to the wider public this was a very concrete example mm -hmm. in which you could say look this is them saying it outright and it's violent, right? It's it's can it's so easy to you can't deny this, right? You can say, well, it's about the men, it's about that, but here's the guy who's dedicating the monument, who helped fundraise for the monument. He's the leading Confederate veteran. You can't deny his opinion matters. I mean, he literally is the head of the North Carolina Division of the United Confederate Veterans. He'll later become the head of the entire body. So, like, his words have meaning, right? Have have a weight behind them. If he says something that's offensive, people aren't going to vote for him, and he keeps getting elected, right? So we know his his words are accepted. So when he says, "This isn't," it's not that it's about slavery now. It sort of shifts the debate from being about is this a monument to slavery to is this a monument to Jim Crow? And I think that shift in the debate, um, which I think didn't necessarily just come about because of the speech, but also came about because of a growing awareness um, around the country of these issues, right? But I do think it's really an interesting thing. And I didn't appreciate what Silent Sam functioned as on campus either at the time. Mm -hmm. I I had not talked at that point. I was, when I first found it, I was a first year graduate student. Um, and I was a couple of years in when I published the, the letter to the editor. But um, I had to talk to a lot of students of color or faculty of color about how they felt walking by this monument. It had never even occurred to me to ask them because it was like, it was part of the scenery. And I think this is sort of how monuments yeah. often function, right? Is that they mm -hmm. seem mm -hmm. innocuous to those they're meant to be innocuous to, yeah. while not yeah. being innocuous to those who they're not supposed to be innocuous to. I mean, they're very purposefully able to carry multiple messages in some way. And so I didn't appreciate like the impact this had on students of color, on faculty of color. And it was in time, as I was on campus longer, I began to sort of talk to these people and have them explain to me um, exactly what these monuments meant to them. And so for me, like my understanding of the monument when I wrote that letter is different than it is today. Yeah. And so this is why I say again, like I think that you have to really go back to the activists um, who, who understood in some ways better than I did um, what this meant going forward and how this could be a tool for them to really educate the public about what these monuments were meant to do. Um, and yeah. I think, and so in that way, you know, it, it's, but looking back on it, it's also kind of fun, 
I will be honest. It is, I, I, I do worry sometimes that my gravestone will say, he's the guy who found that damn speech, right? Like that's all I'll ever be remembered for. Um, but it is, it is, there is a, a certain sense of, of pride that your research is being read. You know, so often as academics, uh, we think of our research as reaching, you know, 50 people. Right. Uh, right. And to have your research um, be cited in the renaming of two different buildings at this point, uh, both at Duke and at the Durham Public School System have renamed buildings, yeah. named of the car. Both of them cite my research to have, um, you know, this monument ultimately be removed in large part, I would say, because of a change in public opinion about this monument, um, a change that may have occurred regardless, um, right, because of other there are things going on around the country. I'm not sure um, how it would have played out differently. I think that there were other forces at hand. I don't think it's just the speech by any means, but I think the speech did serve as a really key talking points, at least locally, yeah. to yeah. convince people. And that's why there's so little support in Chapel Hill uh, for the monument. Whereas, um, and so I think that to me, um, there is a sort of sense of pride that I do feel that um, my research was able to um, enter the public discourse that my research wasn't just uh, esoteric yeah. Um, yeah. and read by scholars that there is an opening that's why um, and the other reason I wrote this book the way I did was that I wanted this book to be accessible um, I think yeah. that to me was very important and it was something I talked to the press about early on was that I wanted this book to be priced in such a way that it could be used in classrooms that it could be sold at the you know UNC bookstore to people wanting to learn about their own campus that it could right. be assigned um, because I do think in some ways looking at our own campuses is one of the best ways to teach our students yeah. uh, because they're vested in it, right? Mm -hmm. They're invested in what's going on around them. So if I use examples that they can latch on to yeah. um, as impacting them, it has a deeper meaning. And so that's why one of the reasons when I teach, right, I like to go out to Marion Square in Charleston and look at monuments with my students and talk about right, what is this monument? Yeah. meant to represent yeah. what do we know about this monument as we're looking at it right because they walk by it every day and they have to think to themselves wait why do i not notice this monument or why do i notice this monument right. depending right. on which who the student is yeah. and um yeah. so yeah there is a sense of pride i think um but uh and and it's it's fun to see uh, on some level to see your research matter um and mm -hmm. to see people yeah. people cite yeah. it um but again, I, I never realized this was gonna happen. And I got pulled along into it um, unexpectedly. Uh, and so in some ways I was very fortunate and I have to thank the activists for also uh, teaching me that this was a book that I should write um, sure. as, as they really did. And they did the hard work. I did this from my office. You know, I was safe. They're out there like literally dealing with the, a police force that overreacts constantly towards students. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a police force that is, is frankly, as an alumni of the University of North Carolina, I'm embarrassed by um, and, 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 and ashamed at their actions um, and the way that they've, you know, arrested and targeted students mm -hmm. rather than targeting white supremacists who are armed on campus yeah. is to me, um, they're the, if you're looking for heroes in the story who are, taking risks it's them i mean i'm i'm just writing some history and they're realizing how it can be used yeah